Hello and welcome to Market Domination. I'm Julie Hyman. That's Josh Lipton live from our New York City headquarters. We are giving you the ultimate investing playbook to help tune out the noise and make the right moves for your money. And here's your headline blitz getting you up to speed one hour before the closing bell rings on Wall Street. This is somewhat disappointing. Having uh, a reading that's slightly above the consensus of 0.3 for both headline and core is somewhat concerning. Uh, looking into the details, though, I would point out that some of the increases were uh, very specific factors that the Fed perhaps doesn't have that much control over. A lot of people like to look at a three-month average. So our three-month average is actually moving higher. We saw that in the PCE as well, especially in the super core. It's basically telling the Federal Reserve they're not getting that consistent downward movement towards 2% that they want to see. This is a little consolidation uh, within an ongoing uptrend. It's I think we're in quite a low volatility environment. The buy the dip psychology is still working. Markets, I think, have been a little bit prepared for a wobble, which is why I don't think we're going to get much weakness in this equity market. We've got one hour to go until the market close. Let's take a look at the major averages, and then Jared will get us up to speed on what's happening sector-wise in just a moment. So as we look here, we've got the Dow down near the lows of the session, off by about 538 points. That's a drop of about 1.5%. The S&P 500 also down about 1.2%, also trading near its lows of the session, and the Nasdaq off by about 1.2% as well. A lot of this, of course, has to do with the changing and the repricing of perceptions around where rate cuts are going to be, if at all, this year. And so we're seeing that, of course, reflected in what's happening in the bond market. Big, big move upward in yields today. Earlier, we were seeing even 20 basis points. Now we're looking at an 18 basis point gain for the 10-year yield up here to 4.55%. Uh, we're looking at that biggest one-day gain probably going back to late 2022 or so. And the one other thing I want to mention as well that we are watching very, very closely, of course, it feeds into the inflation story, but also it feeds into what we're seeing in the equity markets and those lows in equities. So oil prices moving up pretty sharply here just a little while ago. There was a report uh, in Bloomberg that Israel was preparing for an imminent retaliatory strike coming from Iran. Now, this is something we've been hearing in recent days that would be happening, that the Israelis were concerned about. Uh, but nonetheless, that new story about it pushing oil around to its highs of the session. Let's get over to Jared Blickery now for a closer look at inflation and what's going on today. Thank you, Julie. Let's start with the 10-year T-note yield. Um, just as you said, that's up about 18 basis points today. Now, where is it coming from? I think that's important, too. Uh, we are coming. We are still over a three-year basis near the highs. And now the next target, now that we've exceeded, exceeded 4.5%, Traders are going to be looking to 4.5%, and the volatility that we've seen in the bond market, and let's take a look at the move index, uh, we have seen that leak into equities today. Here's the VIX of the VIX, and here is the VIX. I'm going to dial this down to a year, uh, so you can see we are at 16. Now, these are not hugely elevated levels, but they are higher than average. I'll get into some sector action in a minute, but first I want to go over some of the CPI numbers. This is about a seven-year chart of super core CPI. That's something we were just listening to with Victoria Fernandez on uh, just a minute ago. Now, the year-on-year -year number is hotter than 5%, and the three-month number has accelerated to 8%, very close to the highs we saw only a couple of years ago. So the notion that inflation is in the rearview mirror, uh, not seemingly the case. Now, here's another thing. I'm writing about this in the morning brief. Tomorrow morning, we have uh, CPI. This is 1970 all the way over here to 1985. And what we saw was we had the this double peak and what's catching traders attention is the potential that we are now retracing that so what happens from here do we go up again do we go down it seems that the ball is in the Fed's court here but uh, maybe the Federal Federal Reserve has lost a little bit of control finding itself behind the eight ball now let's take a look at the sector action because only energy in the green today that's off of that WTI print but look at real estate down four and a half percent utilities down two percent very interest rate sensitive uh, uh, pictures worth a thousand words. You take away Nvidia and not much green in the NASDAQ 100 here. Josh. 
Jared, thank you. Another hotter than expected inflation reading is fueling investor fears that Federal Reserve will have to push back the timing and number of rate cuts this year. A first guess says the Fed will likely need to see 0.2% core PCE prints over the next few months in order to deliver an initial rate cut in June. Joining us now is Brett Ryan, Deutsche Bank senior U.S. economist. Brett, it is great to have you on the show. Maybe uh, just our big picture, Brett. I'm interested to get your take on that CPI print, hotter than expected. What did you make of it, Brett? And how do you think, what do you think the Fed made of it? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Josh. And, uh, you know, as Jared said, I think, you know, the Fed woke up this morning and wasn't too happy with the inflation print. Um, as they've laid out the story from the March summary of economic projections, they really needed to see 20 basis points uh, for the next two prints on core PCE to kind of justify um, starting uh, that mid-cycle adjustment process um, without, you know, seeing a deterioration in the labor market or growth. That kind of goes out the door with today's print, and I think it's it's not just about you know can they go July June versus July, the window was kind of small was so, somewhat small to begin with because you're going to run into um, some difficult comps over the back half of the year in terms of year over year, uh, and so you know I think from the Fed's perspective, um, if they're not able to go in June July, um, then it become then you have to start thinking about you know can they go at all this year. Um, or at least, you know, uh, at some sometime at the end of the year, like the November or, or December meetings. But without any sort of, uh, without clear indication of inflation moving back towards target, which today's data definitely do not speak to, um, you know, with absent a, a labor market shock or, or something else on the growth front, uh, it's hard to see uh, significant rate cuts this year. Um and on the flip side, Brett, you even have Larry Summers raising the specter of another rate hike. Do you think that that is sort of out of the realm of possibility here? Uh, I think the, the the probabilities are still very much skewed towards uh, cuts than hikes, as the minutes kind of showed. Um, you know, this afternoon, the minutes from the March meeting, they were fairly confident that they had reached the peak rate. Um, I think it would take, you know, several more months of these type of data uh, to bring the prospects of, of hikes back on the table. The Fed's not going to hike one more time. Um, you know, if they were going to, to hike, it would be, you know, for 50 basis points or more. Uh, and I think you would need about six months of, of, of bad inflation prints to sort of justify that. And Brett, when you see these kind of inflation prints we're getting, though, I mean, one question, a natural question would be, did, did the Fed not hike enough, Brett? Yeah, so one of the interesting um, point in things about the, the March meeting was that there was a lack of, of, of discussion around the long-run neutral rate. You did see that rate um, come up slightly, just a tenth, uh, in the March summary of economic projections. But, you know, the market expectation is already well above the Fed. Um, if you look at measures like five or five or forward, the market expectation for the longer-run nominal rate is more like 3.5% uh, or thereabouts. Um, and so the Fed is sort of, you know, behind the curve, if you will, in terms of admitting that, you know, perhaps the longer run, you know, neutral rate is significantly higher than what they currently have it penciled in. Um, the conventional wisdom has been that inflation not slowing down is reflecting strength in the economy. At what point does that run the risk of curdling to some extent? And the higher, persistently higher prices that we've seen causing more damage to the U.S. economy or just, you know, sort of it seeing its own um, weakening regardless of where prices are going? Well, I think the, the way to think about it is through, you know, the growth rates, right? Inflation is not just a, a step, one time step up in the level of prices, um, even though, you know, many consumers. Consumers certainly are, are annoyed that they haven't seen any declines in prices. Um, and the inflation progress, to the extent that it's persistent, uh, particularly in core services, is going to warrant uh, a response from the Fed, may warrant a response from the Fed. And that response from the Fed is going to be, remember back in, in August of last year, uh, when Powell was talking about the conditions the Fed needed to see um, to, to stop hiking rates. And, and those conditions were, um, you know, labor market cooling and growth cooling. Well, we have strong growth. We have a strong labor market. And, you know, rate cuts were, were on the board so long as inflation was improving. 
when that stops improving and clearly stops improving, or if we stall out here, it's going to warrant uh, a, you know, a monetary policy response, and that becomes a threat to growth. Brad, I'll get you out of this. You know, we got CPI, now we have PPI on deck. What are your expectations there? Yeah, so the PPI, uh, again, it's not about headline and core. It's really about those components that feed into the core PC deflator. So one of the major ones we got today from CPI is the rents, the rental component. And, and that, of course, was, was still fairly strong. Um, the main components that we're looking for tomorrow are healthcare services, uh, as well and as well as uh, portfolio management. Now, healthcare services uh, has one of the highest weights in the core PC deflator. It's similar to to that of rents. Um, and you know, when you talk about that super core number, what the Fed is really looking at is the PCE uh, measure of super core, not necessarily the CPI one. Um, and then portfolio management is one where you know that that really uh, it's it's predicated basically on the it's. Um, a one month lag to the equity price performance. So the fact that you had a strong uh, equity price movement, um, you know, in in uh, beginning of the year, you would argue for a fairly high print on portfolio management. Um, and you know, the Fed may look through that, uh, you know, given that the equity prices have come off recently. But the bottom line is that if you laid out this. You know, narrative of, of core PC inflation coming down to you know below 2.6 percent. Your year-over-year year rate in Q4, which is your forecast, you're not looking like you're going to hit that. Um, you know, with the prints that we have now, we're looking at right now on core PC, which are more like 30 basis points. Um, so you know, tomorrow's data will will round out our understanding of, uh, and add some precision to our core PC forecast. Um, but right now, it's looking like somewhere above 30 basis points. Interesting. We'll keep a very close eye on it. And to your point about um, equity prices having come off, the S&P, for example, is only down about 2% from its high. So still uh, not that much downside all said and done. Brett, thank you so much. Great to see you. Great. Thank you for having me on the program today, Julie and Thanks. Josh. Thank you. We want to check on shares of U.S. Steel. Now, this is one of the winners amid the sell-off that we're seeing on Wall Street today. The share is up about 1.5%. And President Biden has been hosting Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. The two are wrapping up a news conference. They wrapped it up a short time ago. President Biden did reiterate his support for American week workers. Remember, Nippon Steel is waiting to close a deal to acquire U.S. Steel. And President Biden didn't go so far as to explicitly call for domestic ownership of the company. He had has opposed the deal in the past, and he said today, I stand by my commitment to American workers. Uh, Fumio Kishida, the prime minister of Japan, um, saying that he is hopeful that some progress will be made to actually getting this deal done. Yeah, Biden wants a fine line here because he wants to show his support for Japan, which is you know, a very important ally. He also wants to show those support for those union workers in that key state of Pennsylvania. And they have voiced their opposition to this deal. They want more, sounds like, kind of worker guarantees. So exactly, it, it's become a political football. And of course, Trump and you have senators from Ohio and Pennsylvania, they've also weighed in opposing the deal. Um, now under CFIUS review, so we'll see where that leads. Doesn't sound like we have a hard date yet for no. when we get that. And I'm keeping an eye on my inbox for any kind of response to any of this from the United Steelworkers, mm -hmm. but they have not yet commented on today's press conference, so we shall see. We're just getting started here on Market Domination. Coming up, Hexel, a Boeing supplier, surprising investors by announcing a new CEO and the announcement of who it is is also a surprise. The stock is tumbling. We'll check in on the move and why some analysts are not happy about it on the other side. Plus, Delta shares sliding despite first quarter results soaring beyond expectations. We'll break down the numbers with an expert later in the hour. And the latest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We'll get investor insight on two stocks to help you make the best choices for your portfolio. Stick around, much more market domination on the other side.
Stocks and bonds under significant pressure as hot inflation data and a weaker than expected bond auction have investors taking money off the table. Our next guest says the charts show there could be more downside ahead. Joining us now, Adam Turnquist, LPL Financial Chief Technical Strategist. Adam, thank you so much for being here. Um, first of all, I guess let's just get your big picture take on the reaction that you're seeing in the market today to CPI data and whether the chart sort of showed that stocks have been in a, maybe a delicate position. I mean, we've been seeing some selling start to come more to the fore in the market over the past week or so. Thanks, Julie. Great to be here. And in terms of the big picture, delicate is a good word because we were coming into today's inflation print right at an inflection point. And the level we've been watching technically here is the 20-day moving average on the S&P 500. If you look back since this rally started to accelerate, that 20-day moving average has been a consistent area where demand came in on these dips. We did break below that level um, last Thursday, had a bit of a, a relief rally on Friday, but we're well below that support level now. We're looking at, as, at that breakdown as kind of a warning shot for a deeper pullback here, especially when you look at some of the momentum oscillators rolling over into bearish territory. The big picture as well is that the, the, this really doesn't mean the bull market is over. It's due for a pullback. We're very overbought. And we think kind of a worst case scenario for the S&P 500, maybe get down to 4,800. That was the breakout level going back to those prior highs. Nothing out of the ordinary for a 5 to 6 percent type of or 6 to 7 percent type of pullback within the context of a strong bull market. And Adam, so to 4,800, is that your base case? Base case, I don't think we'll get there, actually, because there's been a large rotation going on in the market that's helped prop up market breadth. So this has been very broad in terms of the rally this year. It's not just a mega cap story. You look at materials, financials, energy, all breaking out to new highs. That's picked up some of the slack from some of the larger caps. And there's a lot of support below the market before you get to that 4,800 level. Maybe you get down to call it the, the 5,000 point milestone. 49.50, there's some key support levels there. I think that by the dip crowd will be welcomed back around those levels. Well, that might be your worst case, but I believe your target is around, what, 48.50, 49.50. That's, lo that's lower than a lot of the sort of fundamental strategists on the street. So what are you seeing in the charts there that doesn't make you, I guess, as optimistic as that crowd? So with our price target that was established and published back in December, the impressive 10% rally in Q1. So that's under review in terms of what we're expecting. We're looking at our earnings growth outlook. We had 235 penciled in for EPS this year. I think you can make the case that moves higher as well. So in, in terms of optimism, um, there's a lot going on in terms of this rotation and technical strength in the market. Earnings continue to do better than expected. And then when you step back and, and go to the big picture, look at the economy. We just added 300,000 new jobs. Um, last month, the employment picture is, has been pretty robust, manufacturing data coming back as well. So you have to ask yourself, how big of a drawdown can you really have if the economy remains resilient and can, can, really continues to do better than expected? And Adam, looking at the tenure here, so we're back at uh, four, five, six. Where do you think we head from there? What are the charts telling you? So we're right at a key Fibonacci retracement level, right around 455. If we get through that level, you have 470, 480. But I think you could run all the way close to that 5% level if we get a little bit extended. And if you flash back to the summer of last year, markets were overbought. Yields broke out above 435. That was a major tipping point for risk appetite. We're getting that kind of same playbook right now. But when you go back, we had a Pretty garden variety 10% correction last fall into those October lows. Market snapped right back. That's not our call for a correction at this point in time, but certainly watching some of these support levels and how well some of the, the leadership holds up at this point. Adam, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Take care. Let's get to some calls that we are watching today and stocks are moving. We're watching Hexel in particular down 11.5%. Now, this is a Boeing supplier, and it's down today after announcing an unexpected change to the CEO and president roles, appointing Tom Gentile, who happens to be the former CEO of Spirit Aerosystems, to that position. The news not sitting well with analysts at B of A, a securities which is downgrading the stock to neutral or to 
underperformed from neutral and lowering the price target to $65 from $75. The analyst said Ronald Epstein noting, quote, the surprising nature of this announcement to name Gentile CEO and president and saying the company did not communicate to the market that it had been pursuing new leadership. So basically it was a surprise that they were looking for a new CEO and appointing a new CEO. And the guy who they named to the uh, job was a surprise. Why? Yeah, double is, whammy. Yeah, and right. why is Gentile a surprise? Well, Spirit Aero Systems, uh, one of the main suppliers to Boeing also, yeah. there have been questions about quality control there, just as there have been about Boeing itself. Yeah, so investors not happy. Analysts don't seem happy either. To your point, uh, Julie Truist weighs in, said this news is unnerving. Mm. So it's one of the more curious moves we have seen. Spirit, they say, has a long history of quality problems inability to generate cash and inability to drive margin expansion. In other words, they aren't clear why you hired this guy, is their question. Uh, stock falling the most in four years, now in the red, this year and over the last 12 months. Yeah, and it's not only pulling it down today. You can see Spirit Aero Systems um, has been under pressure. I believe Boeing has definitely been under pressure. Actually, Spirit's up a little bit today, but Boeing has definitely been under pressure. It's interesting, too. We saw the airlines themselves higher earlier in the day, mm -hmm. and then a lot of them kind of rolling over, even Delta, which had reported positive earnings. We're going to talk about that a little bit later in the show. But just the whole sort of airline supply chain from plane to then yeah. who buys the planes has been under a lot Getting of hit. scrutiny. Yep. Yeah. Moving on, Decker's Outdoors being downgraded to hold from buy at Truist. Analyst Joseph Savello also lowering his price target to 864 from 983 and issues some concerns surrounding the direct consumer growth of the Hoka sneaker. So that was the issue here. Right. Um, so they, they downgrade. I guess what they basically said was they said their car data suggesting direct to consumer growth um, for that sneaker slowed in February, Julie, remains softer through March. Says we're bullish on that product's long term potential, but recent market reactions to slowing growth have been extremely negative. Yeah, they still say that the UG numbers are strong, right. by the way. And they yeah. also say, you know, our data just shows the US. There has been some strength internationally. So that's sort of one caveat they give mm -hmm. with this data. It's also only direct to consumer data, it's not wholesale channel data. Correct. So that's something to keep in mind as well. The other thing to keep in mind here, the other piece of context is the shares have rallied very strongly. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the analysts over at Tru Truist say they've rallied since we upgraded them before. So now it's sort of pricing in the upside and not pricing in maybe some of these near-term risks. It's interesting as well because the analysts also mentioning what we've been seeing in some other consumer brands as of late, and then just we have to keep an eye on things. He did, to your point, he kind of pointed out to his clients where he could be wrong. Mm -hmm. And and to your point, Julie, one, he said, listen, uh, the product remains a favorite in the wholesale channel. Our data has been fairly accurate, but he notes it's regionally concentrated. And comps, he said, do get easier for this product moving forward, but it didn't stop him from, yeah. from cutting. We talked yesterday with Brooke yep. De Palma about mm -hmm. the ugly shoe trend yeah. and how it has been persistent mm -hmm. and strong. But we'll see just how persistent and strong, especially if people are making different spending decisions. For sure. Yeah. Coming up, it's the latest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We're going to get investor insight on two stocks to help you make the best choices for your portfolio. Stick around, much more market domination on the other side.
It's a big noisy universe of stocks out there. Welcome to goodbye or goodbye. Our goal to help cut through that noise to navigate the best moves for your portfolio. Today we're taking a look at financial services, which names are best positioned, which are best left behind. I'm here with Max Sykes, Scabelli Funds Portfolio Manager. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And you've covered financial services for a long time. So let's get to, first of all, the stock that you like here, and that's interactive brokers. So interesting one, the stock's actually done pretty well over the past years, we can see here. But let's run through your case. Case New client growth. And this is interesting to me because IBKR has been around for a while. Yeah. But we have had some other new brokerages come up, but they're still growing their client base. So this is one of my favorite stocks, an incredible platform led by founder Thomas Petterfee. And they've just built an incredible global moat. And you see it in their client acquisition, which is they've been growing over 20% plus yeah, over the last that. couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, still pretty good visibility on that client growth. So they're obviously taking share on a global basis. How are they getting those, those new clients in there? So um, they do a lot of advertising. I, I also think they, they get a lot of referrals too. I think people are very happy with the platform. Um, and then they're also, their access to products. So they really have a more sophisticated platform. Uh, and so they're able to take advantage of that in terms of servicing clients. Interesting. Okay, let's get to your next point here. It's the margins on this business, 70% pre-tax margins. Incredible, right? And if you think about a financial services company, much lower in general for the industry, and yet here they are with 70% pre-tax margins, and that's a reflection of their automation, the platform, the efficiency, uh, and the ability to scale. Uh, so what you're getting is an incredible output of, say, a financial uh, a technology company, mm -hmm. uh, but you're getting it in a, a financial services company. Interesting. All right. And then finally, there's the valuation here. You think the yeah. P.E. ratio is compelling at these levels. Right. And so you, you added up 20% plus growth, 70% margins, great capital generator, and a trading at 17, 16 times earnings. Mm -hmm. uh, so we think that's very compelling. And uh, just out of curiosity, Interactive, their client base, the folks who are trading on it, how do they differ from other, are they a more professional client base versus more retail? How does that look? So they have a mix of clients. Um, they got started with kind of the self-directed professional traders, more active. And they've evolved to service RIAs, um, introductory uh, broker dealers, mm -hmm. uh, and also um, institutions as well. So gotcha. it's, at this point, it's pretty diversified, 2.7 million accounts. So plenty of room for growth. Uh, plenty of diversification in terms of the potential TAMs for those. So, all right. And, and let's also talk about what could go wrong. We always like to point that out. And if we do see much lower interest rates, which especially after today, it's not looking like it's happening anytime soon. But what would be the effect here? So they've been they've benefited because they have huge balances. They have 460 billion of client equity, and that's in margin loans, credit, etc. Um, and so they benefit from higher rates where they keep short duration securities. To the extent that uh, we do get a lower rate, so let's say, maybe not today as we know, but 25 basis points decline, that would be about 60 million impact to net income. And last year, interest income was about 2.8 billion, so it's about 2% mm -hmm. impact to earnings for a 25% decrease in rates. Uh, but over time, since you grow the balances, even though you might have a little lower rate, you will eventually make up that income. So you're still on a pretty good growth trajectory, even with the fluctuation of interest rates. Gotcha. And do you hold shares of interest? I do. Yeah, okay. I do. Both gotcha. personally and for our funds. Okay. All right. Let's get to the stock you don't like here. That's Upstart Holdings. This is not as well a known a name, I think we can say, but it's a, a lender that operates online. Um, and first of all, it's not a profitable one. Right. And and at Cabelli, you know, one of our big uh, folks is in terms of our research is we, we look for cash generative businesses. And this is a company, innovative platform, mobile application, very smart people running it. Uh, but at this point, they're still not profitable. And what are some of the headwinds that you referred to as well? So they do personal lending, auto lending, and we've, you know, we've had this incredible credit tailwind and we're normalizing now. So as we come out of that, you know, there's the potential for more write-offs, bad loans, et cetera. So gotcha. it'll be interesting to sort of see how it comes out of the, yeah. the cycle. And then uh, also a lumpy revenue. What, what is causing that lumpiness in the revenue outlook? So um, demand for their, their loans on their platform and how they're sourcing it. Um, so a year ago, uh, no, uh, sequentially they did about 4% increase in loans. Mm -hmm. But year over year was a 4% decrease. Uh, and so that, you know, they're testing the model. Obviously, they want to make sure they take on the right loans, et cetera. Uh, and so there's a little more lumpiness to it, gotcha. uh, so less visibility. 
And then finally, we've seen some insider selling. We have a chart of this actually where we look at, here we go. So this is the insider buying over the past three months versus selling. And then over the past 12 months, it's a little more notable that there's been a lot more selling. What's going on there? Well, um, first of all, th there's some option exercises that sort of look, you know, mask kind of this buying. but. Mm -hmm. You can see that there's been some selling and, and, and consistency over the last 12 months, and there's a number of reasons for people to sell. I mean, uh, to realize income, et cetera. Uh, but generally, when you have this degree of selling, it, it's it's not a confidence builder for investors like me looking uh, to, to be interested in the business model. So just like we talked about the um, you know risk to the upside for interactive brokers, the risk to your downside case here is that the firm evolves that business model, maybe gets some more stability in that revenue. Right, so they're, they're rapidly growing. They've taken some share in terms of personal lending, autos, et cetera. Um, so to the extent that they can evolve the model into a much more profitable entity uh, and, and scale it up, then I think that would be of interest to us. But so far, we're, you know, we're a work in progress. And again, we have a discipline of being in those cash-rich general right. businesses. Gotcha. And do you have any position one way or the other in Upstart? No. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. So let's summarize what you're telling people here. Buy interactive brokers for steady growth, solid margins, compelling price to earnings ratio, avoid Upstart, at least for now, for potential because of potential revenue headwinds and that revenue outlook, also insider selling activity. Thanks so much, Mac. Appreciate you being here. Thank you, Julie. And thank you for watching Goodbye or Goodbye. We'll be bringing you new episodes three times a week at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. Time now for the day's trending tickers. We draw closer to the closing bell on Wall Street. Let's take a look at shares of Roblox at the announcement of its partnership with Pubmatic. So Roblox, of course, went public a few years ago, monetizes mostly from sales of of virtual currencies that the kids use to buy all that stuff in game jewelry, stuff like you know outfits for avatars. Uh, but now Roblox, it sounds, ramping up its push to attract ad dollars. So that was the news today is tapped ad tech firm Pubmatic to it sounds like kind of help with sales of, of video ads on the platform and also has reportedly hired ad industry veterans too from Meta and X and the like. Yeah, it's unclear why Pubmatic is trading lower by the way on this sure. news one would think and it was initially trading higher uh, when this report first surfaced in the Wall Street Journal but now has turned lower. But you know, in terms of Roblox, it has this um, customer base. And by the way, it sounds like the ads are not gonna be served to their youngest mm. players, right? It's just a certain cohort. But you've got this whole uh, big player base that is not tapped by advertising. I guess there had been some speculation about whether Roblox was gonna try to develop its own ad mm -hmm. platform in-house, but it sounds like it's not doing that for now. But, you know, it doesn't make money. Roblox yeah. doesn't. So maybe this is a potential way for it to yeah, do Yeah, lever so. to pull. I mean, sometimes you forget just how popular that platform is. Oh, well, I don't forget. <laughs> averages more than 71 million daily users. Yeah. That's a lot of fans. Yeah, although the pendulum has swung a little bit Fortnite yeah. in my house. Has so it? For, for, yeah. for the moment. I think it's yeah. still... <laughs> Both, unfortunately. There's a lot of time spent in front of screens. But anyway, that's yeah. another story. Let's talk about Alibaba founder Jack Ma. He reportedly praised the company's restructuring and top leadership in a memo to employees and those shares up 2% almost in today's session. As we talked about earlier, it's notable, especially in a down market when you have an increase in shares. Um, Jack Ma, we haven't heard from him so often recently, mm -hmm. but in this memo, uh, which was reported on in various places here, he talked talked about reforming for the future, moving forward here, um, and just sort of trying to improve employee morale. Yeah, I mean, Alibaba is just an interesting one because remember there was that grand plan they put out and it was going to be IPOs and listings, but then kind of reverse course and they abandoned plans to spin off the cloud computing unit. Um, but also, they're still splitting it up, aren't they? Well, just they, not in as many pieces. Yeah, I guess? that's what. There was a plan to, to be much more aggressive, and they've, yeah. they've. And we had another kind of pullback in March with the same same theme. Also, of course, dealing with you know, you got the shaky economy. You've got um, obviously new rivals like PDD. So no surprise, stock is in the red this year, down about thirty percent over the past twelve months. And by the way, just quick note: it's also interesting to see Alibaba rallying on a day when we learned that Fitch downgraded yep. its outlook on China's credit yep. ratings following. Mm -hmm on the heels of Moody's doing that late last year. So just another thing to note. Finally, SoundHound AI shares dipping in today's trade amid plans to sell stock. The intended sale comes amid a surge 
in the stock this year after NVIDIA listed SoundHound, remember, as a holding. So um, obviously, listen, we've talked about this stock, Julian. We've spoken to the CEO, a hot stock, another way investors have been looking to play the, the AI theme. They do, of course, AI voice technology. Today we're down here as the company announces plans to sell stock, mm -hmm. entered into an agreement for an at-the-market equity program. Sounds like they can sell up to 150 million of stock from time to time, and obviously these kind of moves, they can spook investors who then worry about capital dilution. Right, basically. So what I thought was interesting today is sometimes when we have gotten these kinds of announcements from so-called meme stocks, and Sandhound is a, a little meme -y, right? Mm -hmm. The shares have actually gone up, but that didn't, I mean, it actually behaved in a sort of more traditional, rational way in response to this announcement. But as we've talked about, the shares have still more than doubled year to date. Yeah, up, up even more than 100% percent already this year. Yeah, exactly. So they're <laughs> taking advantage of that to raise yep. some money. All right, another hotter than expected inflation reading coming in today. And while oil has been climbing recently, prices for crops like corn, wheat, and soybeans have fallen over the past year. Let's discuss how inflation dynamics are affecting the business of farm equipment. Joining us now, Agco Chairman, CEO, and President Eric Hansodia. Eric, it's great to see you. Thanks for being here. Great to see you, Julie. Thank you. So I know you guys just closed on the big deal for your joint venture, and I want to get to that in a moment uh, with Trimble that really has a lot to do with agricultural technology. But first, I got to get your thoughts on the big economic news of the day in the form of the CPI report. And I know you guys have been raising prices a little bit, I believe by one and a half percent is the plan. But what are you seeing in your business in terms of inflation? Well, first of all, the ag business generally doesn't move at the same pace as the general economy. It's more tied to the price of grain and in turn the profitability of the farmer. Now, inflation and, and in turn interest rates do have some impact because many of our farmers finance their equipment, uh, but they often finance the net between their purchase of new and what they're trading in. So it's not a huge headwind. It is a headwind, but not a huge one like it is in some other industries. And Eric, another issue I want to get your take on, the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsing in Baltimore, Eric. You do all uh, use that port from what I understand. I'm just interested in what kind of the, the ramifications, the impact, Eric, on your business. Well, I mean, I'd, I'd have to start with saying our, you know, our thoughts and prayers go out to the tragedy that happened there, to the people involved, and the economic impact of all of those in the area. It's certainly going to be a major disruption for those folks. So that's primary. Really, for our business, it's not a big impact. We we utilize a lot of different ports. We've already redirected traffic. Uh, we essentially feel like no customers will be impacted, no factories will be impacted by supply um, or finished products. So, um, it, for for our business, it's not a huge topic. So let's get to the big topic for you, Eric, and that is indeed the closing, the recent closing of this joint venture with Trimble to form PTX Trimble, which is focused on things like precision agriculture and kind of next generation agricultural techniques. Um, just sort of first of all, explain to folks what exactly this is going to entail and what it's going to do for your business. Well, it's the largest ag tech deal in the history of the industry. We are so excited. I've been in agriculture and, and innovation my whole career, essentially my whole life. And I, this is probably the most exciting week of my career. Um, and, and the reason for that is we're bringing together two of the top teams in the industry to form one new, powerful, absolute world leader now in the development of precision ag technology for what we call is the mixed fleet. Uh, and essentially what that means is we serve farmers not only for one brand, like the uh, one set of brands, like the Agco brands, but we serve all farmers, no matter who they've bought from in the past, we'll sell technology upgrades to take their existing machine and give it new capability with a technology module. So we serve all farmers all around the world, no matter whether it's new equipment or machines that they have in their fleet that could be 5, 10, 15, 20 years old, we can upgrade it. I'm just I'm interested, Eric, though, with this with this Trimble acquisition, how does what you offer differ than what Deere offers? Well, essentially, we're both focused on far, uh, solving one of the most, some of the most difficult farming problems. But uh, a couple of differentiators. Number one is our go to market strategy. We're very focused. That's why I, I mentioned we're very focused on this retrofit approach to the mixed fleet. Agco, through our precision planting business, and Trimble had the same DNA, same mindset, in that we are going to solve the farmer problems for all farmers. So our competitors typically serve their brand of equipment, um, where we serve 
you know, we have Fent and Massey Ferguson and Valtra as our machinery brands. And if someone wants to buy a new piece of equipment, we'll put the technology on that. That's one avenue to the market. But two other avenues to the market, we serve over 100 other ag equipment manufacturers. We call them OEMs. Over 100 other OEMs that will sell this technology to them to put it on, in, on their product and sell it from the factory. And then the third path to market is this retrofit approach, where we'll sell a module to a farmer that they can keep their existing machine and just upgrade it with a technology module, giving their machine new capability. It can now do something for itself. The, the machine has new intelligence than it had before. So retrofit, OEM partner, and our own machinery. Everybody else really just focuses on their own machinery. Now, Eric, you mentioned earlier that what happens in this sort of ag economy happens on a little bit of a different cycle from necessarily the broader economy. And indeed, you saw farm incomes peak, what, a couple of years ago. We've seen them sort of trend down. Where are we in this cycle, and how are you trying to capitalize on where we are in the cycle with this venture? Well, we're, I'll start with where are we in the cycle. We had extremely strong years in in uh, 2021, 2022, and even into 2023, we were racing to keep up to all the demand that we had. And it was actually unhealthy, high levels of demand. We were, we were having extended delivery times to our farmers. So we've got that back under control. We've got our supply chains healed. Factories are running really well. Really well. Um, our partnerships with our suppliers are going very strong. So that side of the equation is good. We still have pretty strong order banks, but much more in the normal range compared to what we've had over the last couple of years. It's true, farm income is down, but it's down from an extremely high level. Uh, it, this, this year will be not as strong as the last couple of years, but in general, um, the, the, the farming business will still be, if you look over a 10 year horizon, still a, a, a relatively good year. What are we doing to try and support farmers during this time when it's not as good as the last couple of years? We're trying to provide technology solutions to them to solve their most challenging problems. And this retrofit approach really comes into play when the economy is not so strong. So instead of buying a new $350,000 planter or a $600,000 sprayer, they can keep their existing machine and instead buy a, an upgrade kit, the new technology that can provide new functionality on that existing machine for a much lower price point. Uh, and so our, our aim is to have an ROI, return on investment for the farmer, of one year, maximum two, for these, these retrofit kits. They pay for themselves very, very fast in terms of either improving the farmer's yield, getting more harvestable crop out, or reducing the amount of inputs they're using to be more efficient. So that's our focus. It's, a, it's even more valuable right now. Even though the industry is coming down, our retrofit business is growing. Eric, got to leave it there, but we'll chat again soon. Eric Kenzodia of AgCo, thank you so much. Always love talking with you. You too. Well, let's take a look at the markets as we've come off session lows. Uh, let's take a look at the major averages here. Still lower across the board, but well off the lows, in fact. The Dow now down about 405 points, a little over a percent, but the S&P 500 and NASDAQ have paired their declines to less than 1%. We'll keep an eye on the markets and keep you on top of it all. Stay tuned. We've got more market domination on the other side.
Delta Airlines managing to get past some of the turbulence in the industry as it posts a better than expected first quarter profit. CEO Ed Bastian spoke with Yahoo Finance and offered an upbeat outlook on the upcoming summer season. This year to date, we've seen the 11 highest sales days in our company's history. Uh, that's a strong predictor that spring summer season is going to be uh, quite healthy on the, on the travel side. Here with more on the latest airline industry check-in is Raymond James, Managing Director of Savi Sai. Savi, it's good to see you. So it was interesting. So Delta Report, investors seemed like they, like they, they, they liked what they heard. They bit up the stock, but now we're actually down here about 2.5%. What did you make of the results, Savi? I, I thought it was a really strong result, uh, both 1Q and the, and the 2Q outlook, and I think it's coming in better than expectations. I think the market today is reacting to more macro concerns, um, you know, with geopolitical issues and, and concerns about the Fed. But I think everything that Delta had to say and, and what they're seeing has been very positive. Savi, it's Julie here. What do you make of the consistency and persistence of demand for travel here? You know, we had obviously the whole revenge travel idea that people were making up for lost time. Now you would have thought they would have more than made up for it. Is this, is this the normal level of travel that we can uh, expect? I, I do think that it is uh, kind of a, a normal level coming here, Julie. And, and though on top of that, you do have some corporate travel that hadn't fully recovered. So we, you know, a lot of the uh, airlines that have exposure to big, large kind of corporate travel are also benefiting from that, especially the tech and finance sectors hadn't recovered. And you're finally starting to see those sectors kind of coming back. They're still very low levels, uh, but recovering well from those low levels. So I think they some of that recovery and then leisure and BFR uh, visiting friends and relative travel seems to be just you know growing in, in, in a new normal here. And, and Savi, what about jet fuel prices? I'm interested, you know, what are the trends we're seeing there? And what does it mean uh, for Delta, but uh, as well as other names in your coverage universe? Yeah, jet fuel has remained elevated. Uh, it's it's better than it was in 2022, and 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 definitely even in 2023. Um, but it's 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 remaining elevated, but manageable. And and you know the biggest thing that airlines have in terms of uh, kind of being able to pass through those costs, if if the demand can't bear it, then they have to kind of adjust capacity. Um, so if, if it, there is kind of a, a move up in jet fuel, I would expect airlines to constrain capacity. You know, adjust off peak day flying. Um, and pass that through. Usually with a three to six month lag, uh, you can see quite a bit of that pass through. And then within 12 months, it's fully passed through. Savi, we got the hot um, inflation print today. Is there any danger that as customers are paying more uh, higher prices, not necessarily for flights, but for other stuff, that they'll make different choices about travel, that there will be some kind of pullback? I think what we've seen, and this is something we've seen even pre-pandemic, is that people have been valuing experiences more. And so I feel like the, the areas that they pull back is probably not travel. Now, they might decide to travel to different destinations, uh, uh, but travel itself seems to be really important to people. Um, and so I, I don't expect that to, to be an impact. And, and you know, even talking about the fuel spike, I think the risk is less about, you know, are you able to pass it through? But if it kind of turns into, gives the economy, uh, you know, pressure that, that runs into a recession. Uh, but beyond that, even in a kind of downturns, you've seen people willing to travel. And really the, the loss of travel that you see even in downturns is more business uh, businesses as they kind of tighten belts. And Savi, you, you do have a, a strong buy on Delta. W what are the catalysts ahead that you think are going to move this stock even higher? I think there's a, a lack of kind of belief on, on the sustainability of earnings. And I think as you kind of get further away, it's, it's been a pretty rough kind of recovery coming out of the pandemic. There were a lot of false starts. Then you had a lot of operational issues. And I think 2024 is really the first, you know, quote, unquote, quote, unquote normal year that we are seeing for these this group. So I think showing that you can hold on to that earnings. And even if there are kind of recessions or high fuel that, you know, just with a lag, earnings is sustainable. I think that's going to be the key to really get the stock moving and, and, and getting a better multiple, I think. And then finally, Savi, um, we haven't talked about Boeing yet, but obviously Boeing is very much on the minds of airline executives right now. It seems as though Delta is not seeing a big negative effect. Who do you think is going to be most exposed and, and who are we going to hear the most about it uh, from in terms of the airlines this earnings season? 
Yeah, obviously from a max specific issue, the kind of the biggest uh, impacts are in the U.S. space, Southwest and United, but also Alaska. Um, and, you know, but it's, it's not just, I mean, Boeing is definitely having issues delivering um, and Airbus is, is at least kind of now delivering to a slower, lowered level of uh, expectations, but delivering. And then you have the GTF engine issue. So I think capacity is is a problem for the market as a whole. But you're right from a from a Boeing specific standpoint. I think there are kind of other airlines that are impacted more than than Delta at this point. Savi, thank you so much for joining the show today. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, wrapping up today's market domination, don't go anywhere. We've got you covered with all the action following the closing bell. Stay tuned for market domination over time.
There's the closing bell on Wall Street, and now it is market domination overtime. We are joined once again by Jared Blickery to get you up to speed on the action from today's session. Let's start with the major averages here, finishing very slightly up off the lows of the session here for all three major averages. In the case of the Dow, off by nearly 1% at 423 points was the drop here. The Nasdaq Composite down about 8 tenths of 1%, so not down more than 1% like we saw earlier. And the S&P 500 down almost 1%. Just wanted to point something out that I noticed earlier here, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about the pullback that we have seen in the S&P 500. But if you look at it from the highs, it's not even 2% down. So there has been more rockiness as of late. But percentage wise, it hasn't added up to that much when all is said and done. Where we have seen a lot of the selling today has been in the Russell 2000. So if you look at the performance here down by nearly 3% this uh, today, we were just looking at the year to date as well. It's a little change slightly to the downside for the year because this is a group that is seen as being especially vulnerable to higher uh, rates. And speaking of higher rates, just to check again, as we did earlier on that 10 year yield, which saw a big, big move upward today of 19 basis points to 4.56%. Jared? Yeah, that's the biggest jump in a couple of years there for the 10 year. Now, let's take a look at some heat maps. Uh, interesting day, and you mentioned the small caps, Russell 2000. Biggest component there are the financials. Regional banks got smoked. So we're looking at the NASDAQ 100 here behind me. You can see NVIDIA closed up 2%. Amazon Meta also in the green. So the mega cap's not punished as a group, although Tesla down 3%. But uh, let's check on those regional banks real quick, because this is a an ugly looking heat map uh, with Memories of maybe a year ago. I don't want to go that far, but here you see down 4%, down 6%, down 8% at the very bottom, LOB and New York Community Bank down about 7.92%. But just looking at some of the leaders here, not a lot of green, crypto qu uh, crawling into the green by the end of the day, oil also uh, some of its related ETFs in the green, but here's regional banks, KRE down 4.9%, Korean stocks as a proxy for uh, chip stocks down 3 0.84%, home builders down, solar down, and cannabis down too. So the fringier parts of the market really not seeing a lot of love here. Here's our meme stocks. And then I'll end with a little green here on the crypto note. And let's look at Bitcoin. Bitcoin up about to just short of 70,000 right now. Thank you, Jared. Tough day on Wall Street after that disappointing reading on inflation, pushing back expectations for the first rate cut from the Fed. Josh Schaefer's here with the takeaways from the day. Joshua. Yeah, Josh. I mean, the big takeaway is the fact that we now have markets pricing out one of the interest rate cuts that we had been expecting, right? So data from Bloomberg showing that pricing now in the markets has us at two rate cuts this year. That's down from three. That's down from what was close to almost seven at the beginning of January. So a very significant move, perhaps notable, as Julie was just pointing out, uh, when we were at the market close there. We haven't seen a massive move downward in the S&P 500 amid that, and I think we can get into that a little bit as, as sort of why. But that's the big takeaway from this inflation reading is we're really starting to ratchet back our expectations for how many Fed rate cuts we're going to get this year. And now I think the broader question for investors is just how much does it matter? Well, it didn't matter that much to stocks today. It mattered some, mm -hmm. right? We saw a sell-off, but it wasn't a huge sell-off. It mattered, you could argue, a whole lot more for the Treasury market. It, it definitely did. We yeah. saw the Treasury market 10-year uh, yield spiking uh, 20 basis points at one point in the afternoon. I think it closed a little bit below that point that we had seen, but it was up to about 457 mm -hmm. Pretty massive move. It was interesting. Uh, Wells Fargo's Chris Harvey was on this morning, and he was talking about how the momentum market that we've talked about a lot in stocks, that applies to treasuries too. And when you see, you can sort of have these big gaps filled, right? We talk about a gap fill maybe after earnings and you see sort of the candlestick go way up in a stock. He said you can see something similar in treasuries too and he expects that to sort of happen. He noted though, remember Chris Harvey is the one who came out yesterday and said, or Monday and said 5,535 for the S&P 500. He said the key level for him on treasuries is that 10 year yield at 5% for more than six months. So essentially saying, we might get some volatility that might finally give us the real pullback that people have been waiting for in stocks, an actual pullback. But for it to really matter for equities, we'd have to be sitting at that level for an extended oh, period of time. That's interesting. Right. It's not like it hits that threshold and all bets right. are off. Right. It needs to stay, to stay there, there, right? For a yeah. While. 
Interesting. But, you know, Treasury yields, obviously, a um, key driver for mortgage rates. Lance Lambert, I'm just seeing here, so housing guru, friend of the show. Lance noting average 30-year fixed mortgage rate just jumped to 7.29%. Highest, Back re over seven. highest reading since November. So tough news for the housing market. Yeah. Not not speaking personally, of course. No, of course not. Of course, <laughs> but not. a great reason. Not. I mean, you're locked in at three percent. Are you moving for that? No. No. No, no it probably Definitely freezes not. the market a little no. bit more, right? Yeah. 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 Definitely. And then there's something else that um, that I talked about a little bit. Jared expanded on a little bit, and that is large caps versus small caps. And we've had a lot of people come on the show this year and say they like small caps. It's not paying off yet. Julie, that was a trade to start the year. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't talk. To, it, it felt like, at least for me, most of the strategists I spoke with, you couldn't talk to someone who didn't at least mention that small caps were, quote, attractive, right? Oh, we, had, we had a string of guests. Yeah. That the, became a drum. The valuation, yeah. the valuation. Yeah. It's got to be small caps. It's got to be small caps. But, but the key here, the key to the small cap call was always Fed rate cuts, right? Remember, when everyone was telling us that, we were looking at six rate cuts. Now you're looking at two rate cuts. Mm. It matters more to small cap companies who have more exposure to that debt. This is something that strategists have been flagging now and why you saw some strength maybe in that route, or I guess I'll call it the bounce off the bottom today that mm. we saw, is people are just flowing to some of the large cap companies. I mean, you look at the NASDAQ 100 today, NVIDIA up 2%, Amazon was in the green, Meta was in the green. These are companies with strong cash balance sheets, right, that have good cash flow, that are making money on the high interest rates on that cash, right? They haven't really been impacted by interest rates, and that's something that people are highlighting right now. Well, okay, small caps, maybe that's not gonna work out, but right. could we have large caps support us, and maybe that's why we could still rally. Well, mm -hmm. and so much for the interest rates being high being a problem for NVIDIA, I guess AI, and for big cap tech, I guess mm -hmm. AI sort of inoculated. Mm -hmm. Those well, it's, at some point, that. if we haven't seen the effects of it, right, it gets hard to, to keep waiting for right. it, I think. It's true, yeah. Earnings Definitely. are still improving, yeah. so. Yeah, good point. Josh. Have to fight it. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Well, stocks closing the day in the red following that stronger than expected CPI print. The hot data complicates the Federal Reserve's next move on interest rates as the central bank works to bring inflation back down to its 2% target. For more on the Fed and the latest market moves, Jay Jacobs is with us from BlackRock. Jay, um, I have to admit, as we were just talking about how everybody has liked small caps, it made me wonder if you had liked small caps <laughs> since you're here on the set with us. I didn't see it in, in, in things that you like today, but I just, I, I know we're gonna talk about big picture, about CPI, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I'm curious what you think of that that so many people have been such a fan of small caps this year? Well, we really focus on what are the long-term structural trends. So I'm a little bit less concerned about the market cap, large cap, mid cap, small cap, and it's how are you benefiting from the tailwinds in the market today? Now, obviously, AI is one of the biggest tailwinds, but another potential tailwind is what's happening uh, with demographic divergence and aging populations. This is the fact that in the United States today, for the first time, there are more people over the age of 65 than under the age of 15. So there are small caps in the healthcare space and biotech companies that really get to benefit from that tailwind. So I don't want to bucket them in with necessarily kind of the traditional kind of uh, core small cap, right. but more of the thematic small caps that are interesting. You also talked to you about opportunity you call in youthful emerging markets. What is the definition yep. of a youthful emerging market and what are some examples? Sure. So you really have to look at the demographic disparity that you see around the world today. So a lot of developed markets, the United States, Europe, even China to some extent, you see have really been aging. They have a, you know, you, you would expect to see a, a pyramid of age demographics. Not that many senior citizens and a lot of young people supporting that age or aging population. What we see in developed markets today is more of a cylinder. You have almost as many young people as seniors, and that creates challenges because that means you have a lot of people who uh, have you know, more health demands, that are in retirement, that are not a part of the workforce, and that shape doesn't really have a conducive uh, uh, element towards growth. But you compare that to other countries like Mexico and India where they do have these large youthful populations. Their workforces are growing. They have ample amounts of labor. They get to participate in this changing supply chain around the world where the U.S. is looking for who's going to be our partner to help build electric vehicles and to help build semiconductors. So there's this huge advantage in these emerging markets that have younger populations and all this labor available to build things. Mm. And so you would look at those markets broadly. I do want to bring it back to the U.S. for just a second and talk a little bit about the macro dynamics that we are seeing in terms of inflation not slowing down as much as the Fed would like. Are there any of the themes that you're watching in the U.S. that sort of can stand to benefit from that? Yeah, so, uh, you know, 
one of the themes that is really, I think, tangential to inflation being stickier is this demographic divergence. So when you have more people retiring in the United States and a workforce that is essentially not growing that quickly. And over the last 10, 10 years, we created about 20 million jobs. In the next 10 years, we'll probably create 5 million. You don't have as good of worker replacement as you would like. And that means workers get to demand higher wages. That results in inflation. Inflation, therefore, tends to be stickier. So that can really benefit. One of the areas that might be a winner in this inflationary uh, trade, though, is going to be artificial intelligence. We see that about 60% of CEOs like artificial intelligence because of how it can get more efficiencies in their mm -hmm. businesses. So if you're expecting stickier inflation, if you're expecting workforce shortages to persist, you know, how do you automate, how do you leverage technology more effectively and make your workers more productive? AI is really perfectly situated for that. And just looking overseas again, Jay, I'm interested, you also say, listen, maybe look to those regions, those countries that are going to benefit from supportive public policy. What's an example of that? I think Japan is a great uh, story right now. Uh, they have really been kind of in a, in, in a period of pretty stagnant growth for a long time. But in fact, the markets have now exceeded their all-time high, which was originally reached over 30 years ago. Mm. And it's because, you know, one, they have good inflation. We kind of have bad inflation. We don't want inflation in the United States right now. We want it to come down. But in Japan, they've wanted it to come up because that allows their workers to negotiate higher wages, which can result in more consumption and really kind of reinvigorate economic growth there. So they have that good inflation right now. Uh, but secondly, the government in Japan has come in and really looked at a lot of the companies that haven't grown in 20 or 30 years and said, you need to focus on shareholders. You need to return capital to shareholders, and you have to get more profitable. And that alone has really reinvigorated the markets in Japan to be uh, paying more dividends and doing more buybacks than they've ever done before, to get these companies focused on profitability. So we've seen uh, our Japan ETF, EWJ, was our fastest growing single country ETF over the last year, bringing in about $4 billion on that uh, interest in Japan. And the irony, of course, is that demographically, Japan was almost exactly the inverse of the other theme you're talking about, but that started to improve a little bit, right? They've, they've been working on getting more inclusivity in their workplace to help address some of the uh, worker shortages they've been facing, but also one of the leading countries in the world for robotics and artificial intelligence is Japan, and that's no surprise. These themes are related to each other. When you have pressures like shrinking workforces, you need to figure out how to get more productive and automate. And Jay, you know, we talked about these opportunities overseas. You mentioned you know, Japan, India, Mexico. What about China? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, you know, China we increasingly see as such a large country that you really have to break it out from the rest of emerging markets. So one of our fastest growing funds right now is Emerging Markets X China because people are really looking at it, much like they looked at Japan 20 or 30 years ago where it was so big in Asia that people looked at the APAC region X Japan and would have an opinion on Japan uh, separately. We see that happening with China as well, really kind of treating it as a standalone because of how large of an economy it is and how it trades differently than the rest of EMs. Mm. Jay, good to see you. Thanks for coming in. Jay Jacobs is BlackRock, a U.S. head of thematic and active e ETFs. Thanks. Well, this morning's hotter-than-expected CPI print weighed on markets and pushed out expectations for the Fed's timings of rate cuts, but it's not all bad news. We'll tell you what it is when market domination over time returns.
Inflation down from its peak in 2022, but it's been rather stubborn so far in 2024. This morning's hotter than expected CPI print weighing on markets and pushing out expectations for the Fed's timing on rate cuts. But it's not all bad news. Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman joining us now with the silver lining in this report. What was it, Rick? Goods inflation, stuff, products. Uh, goods inflation was only 0.6% year over year, and it has been below 1% for the last six months. Uh, so there, we're basically, inflation in goods has disappeared. Now, a lot of people will complain and say, yeah, but many of those price increases that happened over the last two or three years, those are still there. And that, that is mostly true, although there are some things that are actually declining in price. Uh, we have we have seen uh, declines in the cost of used cars and trucks, for example, electronics going down, a few other things in the uh, 28 categories I've been tracking since 2021. Uh, but the other good news here is that um, in earnings are now rising by about four, a little, little over 4%, and compared with goods inflation at just 0.6%, that means um, people are catching up. So uh, the paycheck, the typical paycheck buys more in terms of products. And this, this basically uh, coincides with everything we know about why goods inflation got as high as it did anyway. The peak was 14.2% year over year, and I think that was in 2022. And we know why that happened. I mean, it was the COVID supply chain snafus. It was everybody was stuck at home ordering stuff from Amazon and Walmart online. There wasn't enough stuff. So naturally, prices went up. Well, that has basically reversed. So we basically only have two types of inflation left we're, we're tr where we're trying to solve this problem. One of them is rent which counts as a service. And then the other one is a real outlier that we've been talking about a little bit lately, which is auto insurance up 22% year over year. So those are the two problems we have to deal with now. Everything else is basically falling into line. Rick, another metric that stood out to me though, was that, you know, it was gas prices, Rick. I mean, that really helped drive this hotter than expected print we got. I, it's hard to imagine another data point, Rick, that has a, such an impact on how people feel about the economy and inflation and the signs they see at the local gas station. What did you make of that? I mean, gasoline is erratic. We know that. That's why it's not included in the so-called core uh, inflation measure. Um, you know, this doesn't tell you anything about the what's happening in the underlying economy. The Fed, I don't think, worries that much about gasoline prices, at least at the levels they're at now. I mean, look what's pushing up gasoline prices lately. It's not anything about the economy. It's a war between Israel and Hamas. It's a group nobody ever heard of until six months ago called the Houthis uh, in Yemen that are trying to sink uh, cargo ships in the Red Sea. Um, so that's, you know, and that just follows what we've been seeing in oil prices now close to $90 a barrel. Now, if you're President Biden, all of this matters a lot because gasoline, of course, it's, it's less than 3% of what the typical family spends every month, but it just has an outsized effect on confidence. And these numbers are not going the right way for President Biden. I mean, I'm sure he, I'm sure he wished that by now, uh, you know, the inflation rate would be getting close to what the Fed wants at 2%. And it's not, it's going the wrong way. And Biden is not going to get uh, the interest rate cuts that he would really love, uh, it looks like, in June or perhaps not at all in the first half of this year. So they might come later in this year. But there's a there's a growing chance there won't be any rate cuts this year, we've, as we've been talking about all day. So uh, that's heartache for President Biden, for sure. Rick, thank you. Appreciate it. Bye, guys. The manufacturing sector is showing signs of life. The industry is showing expansion in March for the first time in over a year. And it comes as the government is shelling out big bucks to the semiconductor industry to build plants here in the U.S. This week, TSMC getting $11.6 billion in grants and loans to build new chip factories in Arizona. For more on what this means for the American manufacturing sector, we're bringing in Jay Timmons, National Association of Manufacturers CEO. Jay, it is good to see you. And uh, maybe we'll start there, you, Jay. Um, you know, that TSMC news we got this week. Uh, you know, part of this broader push by the Biden administration to really boost the, the American semiconductor industry. Interesting, Jay, to get your thoughts on that. What, what does it mean for your members, for, for the manufacturing sector? Well, I think it's good news for America overall, Josh. Look, I mean, everything that is manufactured today uh, has some sort of, an, of a, uh, you know, a, a component that, re that requires the use of a semiconductor chip. So you think about all the smart devices in your home, you think about your automobiles, uh, truly just about everything that, that, we, that we touch that's manufactured has some sort of a component like that. And of course, we went through a, a period of months, if not actually years, where we had a severe shortage 
of uh, of the ability to access this part of the supply chain. So part of that was because much of the work was done in Asia. So we wanted to bring it here. But that's the good news, Josh. I think the more concerning news is kind of what's ahead and can manufacturers continue that, you know, those those good economic reports that you just that you just mentioned. We've seen a lot of investment by this administration when it comes to the infrastructure funding, the Chips and Science Act, and even some funding through the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, but we have some challenges ahead, and uh, hopefully we can talk a little bit about those. Okay, shoot, Jay, w what challenges? Hey. Well, hey, look, we have the ability right now to make these types of, of uh, announcements and investments, but we've got some rocky road ahead if Congress doesn't act uh, to to once again reauthorize the 2017 tax reforms that were put in place. We have these C corporates that are locked in and that's good news. And hopefully whoever's in the White House, whether it's President Biden or former President Trump, hopefully they won't use uh, points on the C corporate to negotiate for the balance of things that need to be taken care of, like the S corp pass through rates, like the estate tax rates, which so many small manufacturers are are very concerned about. And then in addition to the tax trifecta that we're trying to get through right now, when it comes to innovation and investment opportunities, uh, those expired several years ago. So while we're we're feeling some really great tailwinds from the government investments, now we have to see some action to provide for the ability of manufacturers to plan for the future, or we're not gonna see that good news continue. I'm interested, Jay, Jay, just your kind of broader view on the Biden administration and, and um, how just their approach to your industry, the manufacturing sector, you know, um, what have they gotten right? What have they gotten wrong, in your opinion? Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to give a little bit of a scorecard. Here's what I'm really um, here's what really impresses me about President Biden uh, himself. I think he probably has more of a heart for manufacturing than any president I've worked with. And that's because he's a product of Scranton, uh, Pennsylvania. That's where he was born. These are the people that he saw working to improve his community and communities around his area. Uh, throughout the years, um, his record has been one of trying to support manufacturing, but frankly, from our perspective, not always getting it right. During the administration, again, infrastructure, chips and science, IRA, those were all good policy um, uh, initiatives by the administration and showed a commitment to growing manufacturing investment here in the United States. But then you saw some agencies perhaps not living up to the promise of, of growing manufacturing in the United States by imposing this massive regulatory burden on manufacturers, and in some cases, putting rules forward that simply cannot be followed. So, so manufacturers today are trying to figure out, well, where, where's our capital going to go? Where are we going to invest in new plants and facilities? Where are we going to hire workers? Uh, it may or may not be in the United States based on that regulatory regime. Then you couple that with the tax policies that are have either expired or are getting ready to expire. For instance, uh, as far as as far as um, um, research and development tax deductions, China actually offers 200% deductions for research and development activities in their country. Today, we offer exactly zero. And that's a problem for us. If we want to out-innovate and we want to out-compete China and other competitors around the world, our tax policy has to be aligned with our commitment to doing so. So I think the president hasn't, uh, he, he's actually been really good on the tax trifecta and we appreciate his support there. I'm worried though that they're very focused on increasing the tax burden, especially on C corporations, should they be reelected next year. Um, and Jay, finally, um, I wanna ask you about the pending steel deal here, the Nippon Steel of Japan trying to buy US steel. The president once again commenting today saying that he supports the workers there. Prime Minister Fushida of Japan saying he hopes something that can be worked out. Um, what is the association's position on that deal and whether it should go forward? So we're confronted with a lot of uh, questions about mergers and acquisitions, and and that really isn't in our wheelhouse. Uh, what I will say, and I would probably echo the president as well, 
when we are advocating for policies, whether they're tax policies, regulatory policies, trade, uh, infrastructure, um, immigration policy, it's all about growing the manufacturing workforce and making it stronger here in the United States. I think it's pretty safe to say that the, the United States um, or that manufacturing in the United States has a heavy dependence on steel, on aluminum, um, on other uh, uh, products like that that help us uh, build the, the base. So we're going to have to wait to see how that all uh, um, unravels or unrolls or rolls out, I guess, is the right terminology. Uh, but in the end, we hope it's good for the people uh, of, of the United States. Jay, thank you so much for joining the show today. Appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Time now for to watch Thursday, April 11th. We're starting off with the economy. We're going to be getting the latest PPI data in the morning. Economists forecasting inflation to slow from February month over month. Prices expected to rise two tenths of a percent. This will be a key reading after that hotter than expected CPI report today. Wall Street looking to the Fed's reaction as the central bank weighs a move to cut rates this year. Moving on to the Federal Reserve, we're getting another round of Fed commentary following the PPI report tomorrow, including Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bach. This comes after Bostic's appearance on Yahoo Finance Tuesday, in which he reiterated he still expects one cut in 2024, but he also didn't rule out either zero or two cuts. And finally, taking a look at earnings, Constellation Brands and CarMax both reporting tomorrow. Constellation announcing fourth quarter results in the morning. One analyst saying the company's earnings could be highlighted again by the durability of its beer business. And that'll do it for today's market domination overtime. Be sure to come back tomorrow at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. We've got more Yahoo Finance on the other side.
More teens are getting in on the ownership of a VR device. That's according to Piper Stanley. It appears more work still needs to be done to leave an impression. Here with the details is Yahoo Finance's tech editor, Dan Howley. Dan. That's right, Josh. According to this survey, it looks as though some more teens may be buying uh, headsets, but uh, then there's still a number who are not interested in buying them and an even bigger number who just buy them and don't use them. So let's just go over some of the numbers real quick. Uh, according to Piper Sandler's Taking Stock with Teen Survey, 32% of teens are not interested and have no plans to buy an AR or VR headset. That's the same number that they saw in spring 2022. Just 9% of teens uh, surveyed say they're interested or plan to end, excuse me, end plan to purchase uh, a headset, while 21% say they're interested, but just don't want to buy one. So maybe they'll check one out at a friend's place or uh, at a store. Uh, the other issue that uh, we talk about is how often uh, these are being used. So only 4% say they use headsets every day. Well, 56% say they seldom use them. That's an increase from 48% uh, in 2022, basically backing up that idea that people might buy headsets, but then they just collect dust uh, on a shelf somewhere after plunking down that couple of hundred dollars. And so this is a big deal for companies like A, Apple, uh, and B, Meta, both of which are in this AR, VR space. Uh, Apple obviously has the uh, Apple Vision Pro, $3,500. Don't think a lot of teens are going to be plunking down the cash on something like that unless their parents want to go ahead and do that for them. Uh, the other is the, the MetaQuest 3, which is uh, Meta's mainline uh, version. That's um, uh, more than $400. So, you know, it's either that or a PS5, and if you know I'm a teen and I still act like one, I'm getting the PS5. So I think that that's a problem that these companies are going to have to overcome. Part of that comes down to ensuring that they have apps and games and, and other things that are appealing to users to get them to want to not only buy a device, but then continue to use it beyond the, wow, this was cool for 15 minutes phase. Yeah. Um, I <laughs> I'm just la still laughing at you talking about spending like a teen <laughs> on your gaming. <laughs> Dan Halley, that's why you're the perfect person to cover this stuff for us. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. Well, something else out of that teen survey, beauty spending rising 8% year over year among U.S. teens. That's according to that Piper Sandler teen survey. The core beauty wallet reaching the highest level since spring of 2018. However, growth in beauty spending does seem to be in need of a touch-up, perhaps. Piper Sandler senior research analyst Kareen Wolfmeyer joining us now to discuss. That's because basically it seems like folks are spending on, teens are spending on different things. But talk to us about the mm -hmm. overall beauty spend, first of all, the fact that it's up 8% year over year. How, how is that looking? What are they spending on? You know, it's coming from all categories. Really, all categories grew year over year. Um, but primarily, the biggest strong point was fragrance, which was up 23% year over year amongst female teens, up 26% year over year amongst male teens. So a huge standout versus the broader category that was just 8%. Um, so we're really finding teens still leaning into fragrance even after several years of very strong fragrance performance. Teens are, teens are still wanting it. And why is that, Kareen? Why, why this jump there in fragrance more than 20%? Were there, just certain, were there new products on the market that got their attention? There might be a few new brands here they there entering the market. We are seeing some more indie brands enter the market, more smaller brands, maybe some lower cost brands but we're not seeing a significant shift in that top 10. Um, and what we think is really driving you know, the, the bulk of this consumption is trends amongst teens in TikTok trends where teens are layering fragrances. They're wearing multiple fragrances at once. They're combining them. They're matching fragrance to their mood. They're matching fragrance to their outfit. So all of these things are causing them to hold multiple fragrances on their dresser, multiple brands, multiple kinds, on their dresser versus just one, which is what we've seen historically from, from prior generations. Yeah, wearing more than one perfume at once is like baffling to me, Corrine. <laughs> I have to, I'm not on TikTok, all right. I know I'm not, I'm not hip. Anyway, add something else, that, that, sorry, that, I'm still wrapping my head around wearing more than one fragrance at once. Anyway, um, something else that stands out to me is the persistence of ELF, ELF, um, on the top of the list as preferred brand. Is that a cost um, issue? It's on the lower end of the spectrum, or what is ELF doing right? It's really not the cost. I mean, the cost hmm. is definitely a differentiating factor, um, but, but it comes from a lot of things, and, and ELF is capturing share both from mass and prestige. 
their capturing share from all generations, um, but primarily doing very well amongst Gen Z. They are master marketers. They have figured out how to properly capture this demographic. They have perfectly planned out what um, channels to be in, what social channels, what gaming platforms, um, TV. They, they've been able to hit this consumer at all angles um, and be able to really connect with the consumer. So it's a lot of marketing. And then also the products they've been able to churn out very quickly and bring a lot of newness to this generation that tends to not be very sticky to certain brands and products. But Elf has been able to do it because they, they've been able to bring a lot of newness and, um, and a lot of very exciting products to these consumers. And Corinne, you know, you look at Elf, I mean, what a run. It's up about 15% this year. It's up about 100% over the past 12 months. You still like this name, Corinne? What, what are the catalysts ahead? We still like it. Um, especially there's been a, a little bit of a pullback as some investors have been getting nervous about um, some slowing in, in beauty spending, but we still think ELF is a winner. Not only is there good white space potential still in the United States and they're doing incredibly well with Gen Z, but we also see a lot of inter exciting international opportunities. They're really only in a few core countries internationally, so there's a lot of opportunity for them to expand their European penetration, um, even expand their Canadian penetration, and also try and capture older generations that aren't just millennials or Gen Z. So there's still a lot of opportunity ahead for this name. Kareen, I, I want to turn to skincare because that has been such a huge trend. And one story that recently caught the attention of our team is some um, skincare brands saying to preteens, uh, don't use our stuff or don't use all of it. It's not appropriate for your skin. Um, what do you make of that? And, and what, do you think that we will see um, real sustainability of this sort of skincare boom that we're seeing right now? I think it's incredibly important that brands are calling out certain products that are not appropriate for younger consumers. There is a big trend right now. It's driven by TikTok and social media for both Gen Z and, and even surprisingly Gen Alpha to really lean into skincare and start building these multi-step, 10-step skincare routines that we've never really seen before. And they're buying products and brands that are not suitable for them. So I think it's important for brands to say, some products are good for younger consumers, some are not. But the ones who are good for younger cons consumers, I think it's great to get these consumers into this category, start getting to better familiarize themselves with proper self-care, proper health, proper wellness, it's so important, but they do need to be using the right products. And Corinne, I, I, so you like Elf, as we discussed. You like, you're like you a fan of Ulta, too. You're on the sidelines, though, with Estee Lauder. How come? Estee Lauder, they, they, they've been experiencing some challenges um, for the past several years, primarily in China, but also in the United States and Western markets. They've been struggling with, with holding their share. We are seeing them start to invest more in innovation and marketing, particularly in Western markets. Um, and really try to elevate these brands while they're still facing pressures in China. So we'll see what happens with these investments. But right now, there's there's just a, a few more um, pressure points going on across the globe for Estee Lauder that makes us more cautious. And then um, speaking back to fragrance for a second, Bath & Body Works uh, has been the top uh, brand there. Is that also a stock you like? That one's come down off its highs. We, we are neutral on Bath & Body Works. We, we see some pressures from the lower end consumer and, and we're, we are fearful that promos may come back a little bit heavier. But overall for the Gen Z consumer and that younger teen consumer, Bath & Body Works is absolutely a brand um, to be aware of. They rank very highly in fragrance um, for both males and females. Um, so they're clearly capturing this market well. We're starting to see some signs similar to what Elf has done with Bath & Body Works bringing a lot of really exciting innovation and newness to the market that is really resonating with Gen Z. So um, over time, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. But, but right now, we're sticking with our neutral. Corinne, thanks so much for joining the show today. Appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. We're talking about the business of non-alcoholic beer with the CEO of Athletic Brewing. That's next on Yahoo Finance. Yahoo Finance's Wealth is your guide, your group of advisors, planners, and jargon busters to help you save, build, and grow your money. How do I know if I'm saving enough for retirement? How do I know if it's right for me to go on that lavish vacation? Is it finally time to refinance my mortgage? 
how do I pay less in taxes? We'll get you the answers you need. Wealth, earning it, growing it, and managing it. It's more than tracking just the latest market moves. It's more than your favorite trending tickers. One does not simply build wealth without considering the entire financial landscape. It takes a community and we've built one for you. Wealth cuts through the noise to help guide your financial decisions so that your money works for you. Wealth on Yahoo Finance premieres March 25th. Meet the king of non-alcoholic beers, Athletic Brewing. The company has come a long way since it started brewing less than 10 years ago, raising more than $170 million from several investors, including Keurig Dr. Pepper. Now the brand is partnering with a country music star for its latest brew, Fancy Like. And here to discuss the latest collaboration is CEO Bill Schufa. Bill, it's good to see you. Thank you so much for having me. So let, let's, let's start there with that, that collaboration. Country music star is, is Walker Hayes. How did that come about, Bill? Really authentically, honestly. Yeah. It's, uh, musicians is a strong and growing, like, enthusiastic group in our, um, you know, they, musicians live a grueling life on the road, mm -hmm. performing, entertaining all the time, but also there's a lot of partying and travel and everything. And I, Walker's been sober for about eight years, I think, and he was naturally drinking athletic brewing, and we got to meet him, and there was just a lot to like on both sides. We had a lot of fun when he came to the brewery. And he started telling us what his dream beer would look like. And before I knew it, he was collaborating with our co-founder, John. And so we're just really having fun with it. And that brings up an interesting question about who your target demo is, right? Who are the people 
who are drinking athletic brewing. Yeah. The long and short, which is a big <laughs> catch-all, is like everyone's an athlete in some way. And this market was so underserved previously. You know, sixty percent of adults have 0.1 drinks or less per week. So they're but like the beverage alcohol world speaks to like a very small set of occasions. We wanted to open that up to any day of the week, any hour of the day, have totally flexible beverages, and then you can get right back on with your life. You can get a great night's sleep, you can wake up, feel great. Um, so we're not out to speak against alcohol. We're just sure. out to bring a lot more enjoyment into the world, bring a lot more people into the beer world, and a lot more beer times. How, how big, Bill, is your TAM, your total addressable market? How big is it? How fast is it growing? In theory, it could be huge. The beer market at retail in the U.S. overall is about $115 billion estimated. Non-alcoholic beer was 0.3% of that when we started. It's up to about 1.4% now nationally. Um, but certain channels are 5 to 10, even as much as some national grocery chains are more than 20% non-alcoholic beer of all beer these days. So that we think as a company that at least 10 to 20% of the future beer market will be non-alcoholic beer. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm more delusional than that, but I won't say that on live TV. <laughs> oh, you can say it on live TV. I mean, I am curious what's driving it, because anecdotally, we've been hearing more about people either, young people either not really drinking in the first place, or people who have been drinking for years cutting back on, on drinking. I mean, which of those do you think is, do you think both of those things are happening? Do you see that happening? And which of those is going to be more your audience? So um, I, I think there needs to almost be a rethink of the terms, too. Like, the word sober is so outdated. It's people drink alcohol at certain occasions and don't at other times. And some people don't drink it at all. Some people only drink it. Um, there isn't another drink category or food category, really, where people have, like, a word for people who, like, if people don't drink coffee, there's not a word for those people. So. Um, it, we're really just giving people a lot more occasions. Most of our consumers do drink at other times in the week or in the month or in the year, but this is something they can drink any day, any time. So we think not only within that $115 billion beer market, but also what does that plus a big occasion expansion and cohort expansion look like? And that can be pretty unlimited. And Bill, I'm sure you, I mean, listen, there's other companies also making non-alcoholic mm -hmm. beers. What makes you all different, Bill? I mean, what's the, is it the price, the product, the marketing, all three? Yeah, I think it's, we're a specialist in the category. Uh, we own all our production. We're dedicated to this and making the highest quality beer in the category. Um, so every non-alcoholic beer we make, it's, non-alcoholic beer is all we do. And we test our quality so strenuously. Every beer goes through 55 tests before it goes out the door. And so there's, um, and also uh, we do think it's great. Like we're thinking about this as a very positive sum mindset that there's well heeled competitors in the category. We honestly don't think of them as competitors. Mm. In the size of the market we're talking about in the future and this wave of disruption, there's room for a lot of support in growing it. Um, but athletic is a little above 20% of the non-alcoholic beer category in the country year to date. We became number one over some very big international brands at the end of last year. How do you make non-alcoholic beer? <laughs> this is something we were talking about in our in our news. First of all, we were talking a lot about the whole um, you know non-drinking trend or non-alcoholic beverage trend. But how do you make it? So that is part of the reason we stand up are entirely wholly owned breweries at Athletic. We have big breweries in California and Connecticut, and it is because we've developed a proprietary method to make really high quality, different non-alcoholic beer. Traditionally, there are two or three methods that involve like highly processed machines, and um, we, we do use a range of different technology and ingredient selection and controlling natural variables to get there. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a fully fermented, delicious, fully flavored beer that just happens to have no alcohol. And Bill, you know, I'm just interested what's next for the company. You've been around a, a while now, you've raised a lot of money. You know, is it you raise more money, IPO, sale? Different products. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, all roads are open in front of us. Uh, we've raised a lot of money, but um, relative to most start, uh, like small businesses and startups that have emerged over the last 10 years, we've, we've built a really deep manufacturing base also. Um, we have real hard assets, an incredible group of 250 teammates. So um, we've really, I think of it as really invested that money in the future of Athletic. And with non-alcoholic beer at 1.5% of beer nationally, 
in, in our heads, we think it's going 10, 20%, if not well past that. So that's a road we want to be a part of and see play out. And we don't know if it plays out without Athletic Brewing driving that movement. Bill, um, is most of your sales right now at home sales, or are you doing channel sales into bars, for example, as well? And in that channel, do you have trouble because some of the big brewers mm -hmm. do have non-alcoholic options now? So are you, what's your progress in getting into those channels? Yeah, uh, beer is really a relatively democratic, meritocratous environment. It's uh, If you are selling great products and investing behind them, beer distributors and retailers will support that. And uh, so Athletic is making a big national effort to get into all channels. We're an omni-channel business. Um, Off-premise, um, like grocery stores and retailers, are definitely the biggest channel out there. But on-premise is exciting for discovery, and people fall in love with beverages they find there. Uh, plus, we are a true omni-channel business. We have a great e-commerce platform as well, so and all those great channels in between now these days as well. All right, thanks, Phil. Interesting right. stuff. As I said, there's a big topic of conversation in the newsroom today <laughs> when people learn that you're coming in. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, coming up, Toyota debuting a brand new 2025 Forerunner. That happened last night. We're going to tell you about it on the other side. Toyota debuting its brand new 2025 4Runner last night, giving the SUV its first full makeover in 15 years. For more, we're bringing in Yahoo Finance's Praz Samri. And Praz. Josh, 15 years is a long time for in between sort of model refreshes or all new models, but it's finally here, the new 4Runner. It's a very kind of a cult following for this vehicle because it's so, it's so hardcore, they last forever. You've seen models going 300,000 miles, 400,000 miles. It's just, a, it's just a very rugged truck. Now Toyota re kind of brand new model, brand new body, more comfortable, bigger, bigger interior, better sight lines, but also most importantly, adding a hybrid powertrain to this vehicle to make it a bit more fuel efficient, more power with that powertrain. So bringing it up to the 21st century here with this with Forerunner, which is you know had a very long history of Toyota. 
Um, and how, I mean, is this a big seller for them traditionally? It's a decent seller. This is, this is the thing that um, Bloomberg is writing about this today, about how Toyota, number one seller in the US last year, but what happened is that they lost out on the midsize SUVs. They started losing out on those. Like They sell a bunch of RAV4s, but they don't sell enough of the, the um, uh, the Hyundai Palisades of the world, the, you know, those types of Hyundai and Kia over surpass them, even GM uh, and the GM2, the terrain. So th this is sort of a way to kind of get back in that midsize sort of segment there. Um, the foreigner might not be the volume seller, but it's just sort of getting them back in the game. Mm. It looks pretty cool. Yeah. Good points for the car t-shirt today, oh, Ross. thank you. Love thank it. You. All right, appreciate it. That'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Have a good night.